Well, hi there, I'm Sandy Alnock, and today I'm going to show you how to paint this really fun and movement filled hummingbird. Every once in a while, I make a card that I think no one on YouTube is going to ever make this card. So if you ever decide to, kudos to you. This is going to be a tough one. But I want to show you kind of some ways that I like to play when I'm watercoloring and change things up as I go. So you're going to see me change my mind in this video, and maybe it will help at least that thought process when you do some watercoloring. I've stamped the bird in Distress Oxide inks, and those tend to not light, they don't keep their movement properties very long. And I wanted to make sure that I softened these wings out quickly. So right away, right after I stamped them, I started putting the water in because I want them to be soft. When you've got a bird that's moving, especially at the speed that hummingbirds move, you're not going to see a whole lot of line work. You'll see just a little flick of a line here and there, but a lot of it's going to just be a blur. It's just going to disappear. So I'm adding the water now so that I don't end up with any more hard edges than absolutely necessary because this is I really wanted it to be kind of a wild loose painting as you saw in the preview image it got really wild and loose by the time I was all done but it started out by just doing this painting of the uh, the water and letting the color bleed out all over the place because I knew I wanted to do some kind of background and if I make a mess of things in an early stage like this it really encourages me to figure out how to do a beautiful background and make something really splashy later because now I've got this this place where the wings are, and the tail are bleeding out all over the place and I used a couple different colors I didn't really worry about trying to make the head one color and the wings another color I just tapped on different colors I'll do a little bit of the same thing with the flowers except concentrating the green on the greenery and the pink on the flowers and then a little bit of blue in the flowers as well I'm going to be painting now with my dot card and this is actual Daniel Smith paint in dots on a piece of paper you can buy these for just a couple of bucks and try out the colors that are in my palette these are the same ones plus I have a few more in my palette there's only 18 slots on these and 24 in my palette so this is 18 of those colors if you want to try some out if you don't have these in your collection and there is a whole video all about my 2019 palette. If you just look up Sandy Allnock 2019 palette, it'll be right there. I do change up my palette from time to time to just try out new colors, but I try to keep focusing on a certain group of colors for a length of time until I feel like I really know them. A lot of us want to use all the colors all the time, and to me that doesn't force me to really get to know them and understand the colors and know their properties and how they work together and what colors are friends with what colors and just focusing on one palette helps me to to just pay attention to what I'm doing a little bit more. So I'm adding some color here in the flowers decided on pink flowers with a little transition to blue so some of that mixes in together and makes some purple. I'm going to totally blow out all the the flower stuff and make them kind of messy as I go. But doing a little bit of an underpainting like this will give some form to them, even though I'm going to be doing some crazy splattering later. So even at this point, I start by spraying some water just to start to break things up a little bit so I don't get too tight. With a lot of coloring, if you're used to coloring with Copic markers and, or pencils and you jump over to watercolor, it's really easy to carry that mentality of like filling in every section and trying to follow the lines really carefully like we do with other mediums but with watercolor I try to get myself to loosen up free up because that's what gives watercolor its life so here is the anthraquinoid scarlet and it's much more of a tomato red than the uh, the quin rose the quin rose is much more of a pinky color and I wanted a really strong head on this bird. I wanted that to be the focus because I want the bird's head to be the thing that's still and all everything else around the bird 
is flying around, the air is moving, the wings and the tail are moving, even the flowers, I'm going to break up the focus on them, but I wanted that bird head to be really important. So I'm going to paint the eye and touching the back of the eyeball and the front of the eyeball to the head so that some of that dark color bleeds into the, the red while it's still wet. And same thing with the beak. I'm painting that dark color in and allowing it to bleed into the red head makes it all look like it's part of the same bird rather than trying to create some hard line between them. Even on birds that have a more distinct separation between one thing and another really helps to just create that continuity when you're painting a bird to, to get all of those shapes and colors to become one unit. For the body, I wanted a little bit of the anthraquinoid scarlet so that I get almost a reflection of the color from the head onto the body, but I didn't want the focus to be there. I didn't want it to be too much a part of where your eye is drawn. I just wanted it to be softer, so I just used my brush to put some water down and let that color soften out and melt down toward where the, uh, the, the tail feathers are going to be. And that's going to give me the reflection of that color without being too much. Now, the cobalt teal blue that I would normally use here up in the wings is not going to be enough to, to put any definition into the, the ink color that's already down there. It's, cobalt teal blue is a really, really soft color, so I used a little bit of cobalt, the regular cobalt blue, to add just a little bit of detail in a few spots. Notice I didn't go and paint every single feather in there, just doing a couple of lines in a few spots where they got lost. And you want some of that lost and found edge. You want it to look very loose. When I'm done with this, my hope is that it doesn't look like a stamped image, that it looks like it's a bird that was painted. Now, the, the lines on the, the flowers and the lines on the outside of the bird are not something I would ever paint but I need to find a way to disguise them if I'm gonna to try to make this look like a painting rather than looking like a stamped image. And that's one of the places where I say this is really hard because I'm trying to make it look like a painting. I'm, I'm making that effort. And a lot of times we don't have any need to make that effort. Most people don't care. I'm just weird that way, so bear with me. <laughs> there, there are tips in and along all of this regardless of whether you're crazy like me and try to try to make something look that way. So I've got some extra color in the flowers, but while that's still wet, I thought, you know, I want to do something a little bit different now with the background. And I was trying to picture what kind of colors that I wanted. And I thought, you know, this doesn't have any yellow in it. And if it's going to be a sandy card, it needs some yellow. So Nickel Azo is a color that I've been really experimenting with. And Nickel Azo mixes interestingly with other colors. So letting a little bit of this light Nickel Azo touch some of those areas of the painting that are already done but still damp will help to blend that yellow into them. And it's also, when you use it really watered down this way, like I'm using it with not much pigment and a lot more water, it just turns into this really soft, soft yellow. And it, it just has a lot of opportunities to do a lot of different things. Now, the Nickel Azo started really working on those flowers as soon as it touched them. So I took advantage of it and started moving the flower color out into the background more and letting that color mix. And it it's giving me kind of a, an orangish color in some areas, a couple different shades of the, the orange and yellow mixing together, kind of fun. Touching my brush to a few other colors, adding a little bit more of that pink in the background but letting it be really loose. I'm not trying to control really specific spots. Now, if I were to actually paint a hummingbird, I'll probably do that at some point here on YouTube, then I would approach this a very different way. But since I'm using a stamp, it requires kind of working around the stamp area. To loosen myself up a little further, because I felt like I was starting to try to control where all of these little little blobs of color were going, I did some splattering. 
that splattering is going to force you to go, okay, now I'm not in control of where all the blobs go, so they are going to go in there randomly. And and it's going to help it to look more natural rather than a controlled, I'm going to put a blob here and a blob there. I am liking a lot of that light color that's right around the beak. It's almost intentional, but it's not. I mean, I didn't plan it, but I have a lot, a lot lighter color right around that beak. And the contrast between that and the dark head is going to create that, that really strong focus. And all of those colors, as they get out to the outside, get lighter. So I let the panel completely dry and trimmed it down, put it on a layer, and then on my card base. And I thought I would show you the difference between trying to make the spatter work by hand and trying to force it versus what it looks like when you actually spatter. And there's interesting shapes that happen when you spatter, but it's really difficult to create those manually. There are times when you're like, man, I just need one little dot right there, and you can make one. But if you're going to try to do the whole thing, it's not going to look like a natural spatter. But I'm going to tap some wet paint, and depending on the thickness of the paint, you'll get different amounts of intensity of color. I'm going to do a little bit of pink, a little bit of green, and just kind of play around with the colors that are already in my painting. And tapping the brush on my finger so that it's up off the surface and trying to see if I can create some natural looking spatters. I'll get some weird shapes. There's that one big weird one under the T that I can fix, but the rest of the spatters that I'm going to leave look much more natural than the ones I was creating by hand. But I can take a baby wipe and almost get rid of entirely that whole weird green spatter. And the rest of them look very naturally spattered rather than painted in by hand to try to control it too much. So there you go. The card that no one else here on YouTube is going to try. But I hope that at least something in this video has entertained or taught you something that you might try on one of your projects. If you liked it, click that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and these supplies are all listed in the doobly-doo down below as well as over on the blog, and I will see you guys later on. Take care. Bye-bye.